Welcome everyone okay. to uh, the third lecture in a five-part lecture series sponsored by Nishmat Am Congregation, the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies, the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy, and the so Southwest Jewish Congress. Uh, we, we have gathered in this series a group of truly, truly world-renowned scholars. And tonight we have an exemplary scholar who falls into that category. Uh, we welcome Dr. Omer Bartov. Uh, Dr. Bartov was born in Israel, educated at Tel Aviv University and St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Uh, his research covers a, a broad range of topics and, and, and history, and I can tell you, I, in my own studies, I'm indebted to his research, and I cite him often. Uh, his early research dealt with the Nazi indoctrination of the Wehrmacht and crimes it committed during World War II. Uh, you can find this in his books, uh, The Eastern Front. 1941-1945, and Hitler's army. Uh, from there, he went to the, the links between total war and genocide, as he discusses in his books, his excellent books, Murder in Our Midst, Merits of Destruction, and Germany's War and the Holocaust. Dr. Bartoff's interest in representation also led to his study, The Jew in Cinema, which shows the breadth of his learning and his erudition. Uh, this book examines the recycling of anti-Semitic stereotypes in film. His most recent work has focused on inter-ethnic relations in the borderlands of Eastern Europe, which uh, we're seeing in the news every day now. Uh, his book, uh, Erased, investigates the politics of memory in West Ukraine, while his most recent monograph, The Anatomy of a Genocide, The Life and Death of a Town Called Buchach, is uh, a microhistory of ethnic coexistence and violence. This book uh, received the National Jewish Book Award and the Yad Vashem International Book Prize for Holocaust Research. So you can see the, you know, the stature of this scholar that we're so honored to have with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Bartoff has completed a new monograph titled Tales from the Borderlands, Making and, and Unmaking the Past. Uh, he has, in addition to these numerous books he's authored, he has uh, edited volumes including Voices on War and Genocide, Three Accounts of, of the World Wars in a Galician Town. And reflecting his new interest, the forthcoming book, very important book, no doubt, Israel slash Palestine, lands and peoples. Uh, if you have questions, please uh, send me your questions in the chat function. And uh, let us now all welcome Dr. Omer Bartov. Welcome, Dr. Bartov. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Patterson, and thank you very much, everyone for attending this talk. Um, what I will try to do today is to give you a little bit of the background, uh, this, the history of uh, um, Ukraine, Jews in Ukraine, Jews in Poland and Ukraine. Um, and the reason I have to mention all of those is that these are mixed histories and much of what we see today um, in, um, the news that we're following um, cannot really be understood without going back much further in time. So in order to do that, I will share my screen with you because seeing this through maps, I think will be useful. So as you can see, this is, this is a map of uh, Ukraine as it is today, more or less. Um, and um, I would like to take you on a little journey, on a little historical journey as to how we got to this place. Uh, now, Ukraine actually uh, predates Russia 
by many centuries, uh, despite the rhetoric of propaganda that you um, may be hearing from, um, from the Kremlin. Um, Ukraine began um, around the 9th, 10th centuries as a principality and then an empire called Rus, R-U-S, uh, from which later um, Russia took its name. Uh, and these were um, Norsemen, Vikings, who arrived at this area of the Dnieper, this, this huge river, that dissects Ukraine and defies Ukraine into left bank and right bank. Ukraine, as these areas have been called for centuries, uh, they settled in those areas and created a kingdom um, which was, like uh, many of the kingdoms of that period, a very loosely organized entity that covered much of the territory that you see here, uh, including what is known, as you can see, uh, West Ukraine, this area here. Now that empire disintegrated over time and by the uh, uh, 13th century, uh, much of that uh, area was taken over by Poland. Uh, Poland, um, this is the, the Polish kingdom, uh, Poland started spreading uh, into the Eastern territories, which were the Western territories of what had been the Kingdom of Rus. And as you can see from this map, which is in Polish, I'll move to one in English. Um, in the 16th century, uh, Poland and Lithuania merged into an entity known as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Now this Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, just like the Empire of Rus that most people don't remember anymore, um, was a huge territory, also rather loosely organized, which as you can see, covered much of the area of what we know now as the Baltic states, Poland, and much of Ukraine. Uh, it, this here is Kiev, so it went uh, all the way east of Kiev. Uh, so covering much of the territory of Ukraine today as well. Um, now, to our point, what, what is interesting about the story is that in order to develop those lands, first the Polish lands, and then these vast territories that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth spread into uh, these areas of East Poland. Um, sorry, this is a missing one image. One sec. Oh, seems to have uh, disappeared. Never mind. Um, the the Polish kings invited large numbers uh, of Jews uh, who were living at the time in what was known as Ashkenaz, uh, that is in Central Europe, the Jewish name for the German lands, and those Jews were already at the time. Um, uh, being expelled from many parts of Western and Central Europe, of course, initially also from England already in the 13th century. Um, and um, there, there were various reasons why Jews uh, wanted to move further east, um, but the main reason was that not only were they being expelled, but that the Polish kings and then Polish lords um, wanting to develop their cities and to develop commerce, offered Jews coming from the West a, a variety of what were known as privileges. That is, they allowed them to have monopolies over the production of alcohol, over the um, over wheat, the, the milling of wheat, uh, and they allowed them to live under their own rule as a sort of separate estate within uh, the Polish monarchy. Um, and so um, Jews found this, of course, to be a, a very good reason to move to those territories. Um, it, it's it's uh, interesting to note that the uh, this Jewish self-rule um, under the Vad Arba the the, 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 the uh, rule of the of the four lands as as it was known, um, was something quite unique within Jewish history. Um, now, 
the eastern areas of the Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth uh, were not ruled directly by the king, and the Polish king was a relatively weak entity, but by vast estate owners. And those vast estate owners, the, the members of what was known as the Shlachta of the Polish aristocracy, the Polish nobility, had their own cities. They were known as private cities. And in those cities, these lords um, had uh, direct rule over the Jews who became a plurality and often a majority uh, of the populations of those cities. So that created a very close relationship between uh, the Jews and the landlords. And there were large populations of Jews in what we know now as Ukraine. Um, uh, now, this was not in, in necessarily an idyllic situation, if you like, because uh, at the time uh, there was growing tension between uh, the serf population in that area, those who were peasants who were enserfed under uh, Polish rule, uh, that is, they, they had to stay on the land and work for those uh, landlords. The landlords often did not want to be uh, on those remote estates, uh, but rather to be in Warsaw, in the areas where power was concentrated, and therefore they leased their estates uh, and much else of what they had to Jews. And so the people who were running many of these estates uh, were the local Jews. And that created a great deal of tension between them and the local population. Moreover, uh, while the Polish landlords were Roman Catholic, and the Jews, of course, were Jews, uh, the peasant population in that area, the serfs, were Orthodox. Uh, and there were religious tensions uh, then, both religious tensions and social economic tensions. Now, there were several uprisings by peasants, and those uprisings were often led by Cossacks, who were a population that lived in the eastern parts of um, this enormous commonwealth. Uh, they were not an ethnic group. They were made up of um, uh, serfs who escaped from serfdom uh, and others, outlaws, uh, there were Jews among them as well, uh, but they uh, developed this sort of culture, a warrior culture, and the, Pol the, the Polish kingdom used them as uh, their own hired mercenaries uh, to fight wars for them, both against the, the Tatars uh, south of this entity and against the Ottoman Empire, uh, also south uh, of, the, of the, this commonwealth. In 1648, then, uh, a major uprising uh, took place, and that was the Khmelnytsky, Bohdan Khmelnytsky, the leader of, this, of the Zaporozhian Zich. Zich, this was the, 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 the major encampment of these independent Cossacks. And this uprising really was the beginning of the end of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. As you can see from this map, uh, the Cossacks managed to uh, uh, take over much of eastern and central Poland. Uh, and uh, as they were doing so, they slaughtered large numbers of Poles and large numbers of Jews. So that, as you probably know, in, uh, in the Jewish tradition, Chmelnitsky stands for uh, the slaughter of the Jews, the scourge of the Jews. Of course, in Ukrainian national ethos, um, Khmelnytsky is seen as the beginning, the, the, the first uh, warrior for Ukrainian independence. And now there was, Ukraine was just a territorial designation. It just meant the borderlands. Uh, but as um, this uh, uprising evolved into a state, into what came to be known as the Cossack independent state, some kind of proto-national identity of um, Cossacks, Ukrainians, developed. Now, as a result of this uprising, the Jews on the, of, on the left bank of the Dnieper, that is, in the eastern parts of the empire, 
or in the western part of what we know now as Ukraine, basically disappeared. They either fled uh, or they were murdered. Uh, and so the, this actually began a moment at which uh, the movement of Jewish populations in Europe from west to east changed and it started, Jews started moving from east to west. And it should be stressed that in Poland, by the 18th century, about 80% of the population of all the Jews in the world lived within Poland. So this was a, a, a major part of the Jewish population. Now, th that uh, early Cossack state uh, did not last very long. To its east was an entity called Muscovy. And Muscovy uh, was what later became Russia. It was not known as Russia yet. So while Kiev was already an ancient city that goes back to the, the beginning of the second millennium, uh, Moscow was a village. Uh, so when you think today about the idea that uh, Russia is bombing Kiev, uh, while claiming that Kiev is the birthplace of Russia, uh, there's a deep irony here. Uh, but to return to history, uh, this entity, this Cossack state did not last very long because Moscovy was then growing. And by the 18th century, what we find happening is that um, the Kazakh state has disappeared and Russia had taken over all the eastern lands of what was then, um, what was before the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth and then the, the Kazakh state. Now, most of the Jews, those 80% of uh, uh, Jews in the world are living at that time within Poland. There are no Jews living in Russia. Jews were not allowed in Russia. And that situation continues until Poland is broken apart. So in the last third of the 18th century, Poland was um, partitioned three times until it entirely disappeared. Uh, and as you can see in those partitions, the southern part of Poland uh, becomes the kingdom of Galicia, known as Galicia. And both I and your rabbi, uh, um, uh, Galiciana, although I was born in Israel, uh, but my mother came also from Galicia. Uh, that Galicia was invented in 1772. There was no Galicia before that, or Galicia, Galician. Uh, did not exist before that. It was southern Poland. Uh, it is uh, annexed by the, Austro by, by the Austrian Empire, the Habsburg Empire, and remains as, as, as an entity until World War I. By the end of the 18th century, Poland disappears entirely. There is no Poland anymore. Uh, it is taken over by Russia, it is taken over by Austria, and it is taken over by Prussia that becomes later Germany. Now, because of this annexation of vast territories of Poland, which had very large populations of Jews, by the Russian Empire, Russia creates the Pale of Settlement. And that Pale of Settlement is where very large numbers of Jews live, in many, in, in many cities, including those that are now in the news, such as Kherson, Odessa, when, when Odessa is, is created, Berdichev, Zhitomir, Kiev, Poltava, and so forth. Um, those are all cities that have large Jewish populations. Most Jews are not allowed into the rest of the empire with a few exceptions. Uh, so to, to stop for a moment, uh, this means that by the 19th century, large numbers of Jews are living in, in, in areas that are Ukrainian under Russian rule, many of which had been before that under Polish rule. So that is the mix of populations and ethnicities in that area. And the Jews form um, a major component of the population of small towns, what the Jews refer to as shtetls, and larger towns. Now, um, a few other um, uh, parts of the story that I will 
go through with you. Uh, this continues until uh, World War One. In World War One, uh, and I go back here. In World War One, um, the um, at the end of World War One, the Polish state is resurrected, um, and and what we find, if I look at the, at the map here, what you will find is that Poland, uh, after World War I, manages to uh, take over what we know now as Western Ukraine. That is this area whose capital is Lviv. Uh, the second largest city is Ternopil, uh, Tarnopol under Polish rule. And Lviv is known in Poland as Lviv and known by many Jews as Lemberg, the, the German name. And Ivano Frankiv, which was known as Stanisławów or Stanislavik. Um, so all that area, which has a um, majority Ukrainian population, a large Polish population, and about 10% of the population is Jewish, after World War I is taken over by a resurrected Poland, uh, after a war between Polish and Ukrainian nationalists. The rest of Ukraine, all this part, is uh, after a very bitter war, becomes part of the Soviet Union. Uh, so what we have is, and, and it has to be kept in mind, West Ukraine is never under Russian rule until World War II. The rest of Ukraine comes under Soviet rule after World War I. Now, during that period, we have an, an, a number of uh, major cases of violence against Jews. So if I go back for a moment, already in the uh, late uh, 19th century and then in the first decade of the 20th century, the major pogroms against Jews, you may remember the pogrom in Kishnev uh, in 1903 and in 1905 and six, the major pogroms against Jews uh, in which several thousand Jews are murdered. In the Following uh, uh, World War I, during the Russian Revolution, there is major fighting between the forces of, uh, between the Bolshevik forces, uh, the white armies, those who are trying to bring back um, the monarchy to Russia, um, and uh, Ukrainian nationalists. And in fact, two Ukrainian states um, exist uh, temporarily one in West Ukraine until Poland takes it over, and one in Central Ukraine. Uh, the state in Central Ukraine, the main leader uh, is Simon Petliura. And Simon Petliura, again, in Ukrainian uh, memory and history and myth and lore, is the second great figure of um, a leader who fought for Ukrainian independence. As I said, eventually, uh, this is lost and Ukraine becomes a, a Soviet Socialist Republic. Uh, and in Jewish law, uh, Petlura is remembered as the man who was in charge of massive pogroms against Jews. And the scale of uh, violence against Jews in, in, in all those cities around this area, not so much in West Ukraine, but in the, in, in, in the right bank of the Dnieper, uh, is huge. Uh, so if we talked about um, um, pogroms against Jews that cost the lives of several thousand Jews uh, in 1905, 1906, uh, in 1919, an estimated 100,000 Jews are uh, killed. They're actually murdered by all the forces that are fighting there, including the Soviets, including Bolshevik forces. And uh, there's, uh, you, you, you may know, uh, the, the stories by Isaac Babel, who was a wonderful Jewish author from Odessa, the Red Cavalry, where he describes uh, much of this violence. Uh, so they are killed by the, the Red Army, by Red Army Cossacks, they are killed by the whites, and they are killed by the nationalists. But in Jewish memory, uh, Petula, who was later in 1926, was assassinated in Paris by a, a young Jew 
whose family itself had suffered from these pogroms, uh, is remembered, of course, as uh, the scourge, the second major scourge of the Jews. And much of this is not remembered uh, simply because the Holocaust, of course, obscured the memory of the, these earlier uh, moments of violence. However, after the revolution and during the 1920s, uh, under Soviet rule, Ukraine uh, has um, a fair amount of cultural autonomy. Um, that lasts until the late 1920s. And so there's a great flourishing of Ukrainian culture. And what is interesting at that moment, that as I say, lasts about 10 years before Stalin decides to clamp down on it, is that there is also a great flowering of Jewish culture under, in, in Soviet Ukraine. And there, there was a high degree of uh, interaction between uh, Jewish intellectuals, artists, painters, writers, songwriters, poets, and so forth, and Ukrainian. Uh, that comes to an end uh, by 1929 when Stalin changes his uh, policy and decides to start killing the leaders of uh, this kind of national, mostly cultural um, flowering in uh, Ukraine. So it is a mixed memory. In the western part of Ukraine, in what we know as Galicia, and in Poland then is considered to be eastern Poland, uh, there is growing tension between Poles, Ukrainians, and Jews. And in that area, uh, because of Soviet, oh, sorry, of Polish um, suppression of Ukrainian national aspirations, as I said, the Ukrainians tr tried to create a state there and failed and because they were defeated by the Poles. Uh, Ukrainian nationalists form an organization, a terrorist organization, uh, which has many affinities with uh, various fascist uh, organizations in other parts of Eastern Europe, called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN. And th that organization formed in 1929 um, becomes the kernel of later the uprising of Ukrainians against Polish rule, and the Ukrainian nationalists who during World War II collaborate with the Germans first in the murder of Jews in West Ukraine, uh, and then also uh, carry out ethnic cleansing of the Polish population of West Ukraine, of Galicia, uh, and continue an insurgency against the Soviets after the Soviets come back to that territory uh, in 1944, uh, of course, Jews remember the, the arrival of the Red Army as the liberation. Uh, for many of these Ukrainian nationalists, uh, this is seen as a reoccupation rather than as liberation. Now, at the head of this, the more radical um, faction uh, of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, of the Ohud, eh, Oun, is a man called Stepan Bandera. And in Ukrainian national memory, uh, especially in West Ukraine, Stepan Bandera is the third big national hero uh, because he fought uh, for uh, the creation of an independent Ukraine. Uh, in Jewish memory, and especially in memories of Jews from that area, Stepan Bandera was the leader of those who collaborated with the Nazis in the murder of the Jews. There were about just over half a million Jews in Galicia um, when the Germans moved in there, and over 90% of them were murdered. About half were murdered in their own towns, including the town that I wrote on, Buchach, uh, and half were transported to the Bezhets extermination camp and gassed there. Uh, if you go now to West Ukraine, you will see many statues of Bandera. Uh, if you read uh, memoirs uh, or listen to testimonies uh, by Jews from that area, those who survived, they will, be, they will talk about the Banderovtse or the Banderivtsi, uh, that is the Banderites. Um, that comes from the word Bandera, from his name. These were uh, groups, militias 
uh, that identified with Bandera as their leader and in Jewish memory, they're recorded as those who murdered them. Uh, and so again, we have a very mixed and in this case, highly contradictory memory uh, between the two. Um, I don't want to go too long because I want to leave uh, time for uh, questions, but I'll just mention a few other uh, important elements. Um, so at the uh, end of uh, World War II, this Ukraine is created uh, and this time and for the first time, uh, Ukraine under Soviet rule includes also West Ukraine. Uh, now West Ukraine is important because it is in many ways the birthplace of modern Ukrainian nationalism. Ukrainian nationalism was created uh, in the late 19th century. It was in many ways influenced by and a response to Polish nationalism. And interestingly, this is also a very important uh, region for the rise of Zionism, which also took um, a lot of its symbols and its um, um, rhetoric from what it learned from Polish and Ukrainian uh, nationalism. Um, so um, this new Ukraine that is created under uh, Soviet rule uh, has its own much deeper history uh, that is recreated as a national history in the late 19th century. And there is an ongoing Ukrainian aspiration to create an independent Ukrainian state. That state, as you know, is finally created in 1991 with the collapse of uh, communism and the Soviet Union, uh, which takes us to the present. So between 1991 and the present, uh, Ukraine has undergone uh, many changes. You may know that in the latter parts uh, of uh, Soviet rule and the early parts of Ukrainian independence, there was a very large Jewish population in Ukraine. It numbered, there were about 700,000 Jews in uh, Ukraine. Uh, most of them left. Uh, the majority of them went to Israel. Uh, they are known in Israel as Russian Jews, uh, but the majority of them came from Ukraine. However, uh, they mostly uh, were and have remained Russian speakers, and they many of them maintain a sort of Russian culture in Israel as well, with newspapers and so forth, and teaching their children Russian. Uh, so they, in many ways, they identify more with Russia, uh, with Russian culture, uh, than with uh, Ukraine. Um, they're now officially probably about 40, 45,000 uh, Jews who are self-identified as Jews in Ukraine. So a much, much smaller population, but estimates are that there are between 100 and 200,000 um, um, people in Ukraine who could be identified as Jews if they were, say, to decide to go to Israel, um, um, but they don't self-identify as such. Um, the Ukrainian state over those years from 1991 to the present has gone through many transformations. And I would say that um, uh, one important element that is, uh, uh, that is crucial to understand is that in Ukraine, there has been, of course, a great difficulty to accept the fact that um, the same people who were lauded as those who fought for Ukrainian independence, um, and if we go back to the 17th century or if we go to the period of uh, the, the First World War and the revolution, or if we talk about World War II, the, these same people are also identified as those who were involved in major massacres and indeed ultimately genocide of Jews. So that has been a very hard process. This is not only the case in Ukraine, there's a very similar case in Poland, and I can talk about other countries as well. But these efforts have not been for naught. That is, there is now a young generation of uh, Ukrainians and Ukrainian scholars who are very much 
or, or were until the, the last uh, horrifying events that are unfolding right now, who were in the process of trying to help Ukraine come to terms with its past, and especially with the past that is so culturally diverse. And Ukraine has always been very culturally diverse. It had many different populations, apart from Poles, Jews, and Ukrainians, also Tatars, Armenians, many other populations. And I would say that what is most extraordinary, perhaps, in what has happened in Ukraine is that only uh, a couple of years ago, Ukraine elected a president who is of a Jewish extraction. Now, first of all, he was elected by a landslide. But what is so interesting is that his Jewish origins did not come up. They were not part of anything in particular. He didn't hide that. It was known, but it was not a major issue. It has become now much more of an issue because of those allegations coming from Moscow that uh, Russia has to denazify Ukraine, which is a completely, which is turning things on their head. Uh, there is no need to denazify Ukraine. Uh, but it's interesting in the sense that if you were to think of Poland or Lithuania or Latvia, uh, there is not much of a chance that any of those countries would elect uh, someone identified in some way uh, as having as coming of uh, um, of being of uh, Jewish extraction and identifying uh, when asked uh, as a Jew, and so in that sense, I think that in Ukraine presents us with a very mixed and complex picture. Uh, it is a place where a vast amount of what we identify now as East European culture, including of course Hasidism, uh, developed. Uh, it was also part of the areas in which large numbers of Jews were slaughtered, and, and it is now uh, at the heart of another attempt to um, break Europe apart. Uh, and so when I look at events now, and I think of all those cities that I've traveled with, and I've been working on my own research in Ukraine for the last tw 20 years, uh, I'm filled with dread, and I must say that I greatly admire the, the will of Ukrainians now having united as a large, diverse country with a very complex but also very rich history to unite and to try to defend their country. And I want to say to you, because I say to everyone, that we should all support them. So thank you. I'll stop here and I'll be very glad to take any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Bartov. That was uh, an insightful lecture, deep, uh, while, uh, while bringing out the, the many layers of complexity in that in the Ukrainian history, uh, paradoxes in that history, tensions. Um, we do have some questions. Uh, I guess, shall I start with the big question? Do you see any way out of this war? Do you see any role that uh, Ukrainian Jews might play in uh, trying to bring this conflict to some kind of end? I don't know, I'm not very hopeful, but what, what do you think? It's... That's, you know, uh, one of the problems with being an historian is that you are not uh, any better than anybody else at forecasting the future. Um, but um, I, I don't know exactly what is going to happen. That's the truth. I, I, I know what I think uh, um, we should do, or we should try to do. Um, and I think uh, it behooves all of us for a, a whole variety of reasons to support Ukraine. And I think that the one place where perhaps um, American Jews can speak out is precisely against this, this, uh, um, this propaganda coming out of Moscow that this is all about denazifying Ukraine. 
and and Putin is 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 not, you know, in, he's not an idiot. He knows what he's doing. When he says that, he is playing on that past. That is, he is trying to say that this is like uh, the Great Patriotic War, the name that the Russians gave to, or the Soviets gave to World War II. That just as Russians fought then against fascism and Nazism and liberated Europe from that, now too they're doing the same. And so he's trying to identify Ukraine with uh, Nazism. And there's nothing that could be more false than that. Uh, but he does manage to appeal, first of all, I think, to certain populations in Russia, especially older populations, people who watch more TV, people who are in the more remote parts of Russia. And I think he manages to appeal to other populations, including possibly some <laughs> populations that have this sort of memory, a historical collective memory of pogroms in Ukraine. Uh, and I think that we have to stand against it and to say what bothers Putin about Ukraine is not that it's being taken over by Nazis, but that it's a democracy. And it's a democracy right on the border of Russia. It's a country that's very close to Russia linguistically and culturally. And therefore it provides Russians with an example of a possibility of having a democracy. And that is what he does not want but he wraps it up in this story of denazifying it. So I think to the extent that we can, we should both help Ukraine, ask our government to be a little bit more aggressive than it's willing to be, and reject this kind of propaganda about denazification. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, you you've already answered uh, a couple of the other questions uh, regarding the Jewish population of the Ukraine, those who identify, uh, those who, uh, who might be regarded as Jews uh, under the law of return. Um, and you've also come this similar question, commented on uh, the, the, the fact that the, that the president of the Ukraine is, identifies as Jewish. Yes. But let me ask, it occurs to me from what you just said, if I'm Putin and I want to denazify the Ukraine, then the guy in charge must be the chief Nazi, the Jew. Yes. So, I, am I being paranoid or does the fact that Zelensky is Jewish kind of uh, irk uh, Putin a little bit that he's... Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I don't know if... Um... Uh, Zelensky's uh, Jewish identity irks uh, Putin. What, what irks Putin is that Zelensky st stood up to him. Uh, he actually stood yeah. up to Trump too, which is not bad to have stood up to these two <laughs> men who seem to like each other too. Um, so um, he, he stood up to him and he wouldn't bow. Uh, I, I don't think that Putin cares uh, a, a hoot about whether he's a Jew or not a Jew. Uh, that, uh -huh. that, that doesn't matter to him. It matters to him that there's a young man and, you know, within the kind of politics of representation and the propaganda that both of them are, the, are using, of course, the kind of irony is that Putin, who presented himself as the macho of Russia, riding a bareback without his shirt on and hunting bears, is mm. now this uh, older man sitting at the end of a, of a mile-long table uh, and looks sort of crumpled in his suit. And Zelensky appears as a young, energetic man in military fatigues. And so uh, that too, I'm sure, irks mm -hmm. him. And what he wants to do, what he tried to do, in fact, was to eject Zelensky with his commandos and just mm -hmm. take him away and put someone else there. Like uh -huh. Yanukovych, uh, the, the man who was in 2014 thrown out by the people of Kiev who came to demonstrate and were being mm -hmm. shot at until they finally got him to run. Uh, and so we have to remember that in Ukraine, there has been a struggle to actually create a democratic system. It's far from a perfect country. It's, it's very corrupt. It's, it's, it does have also extreme right-wing elements uh, in it, and especially in West Ukraine. But the vast majority of people 
actually fought for a democracy. Uh, and that is what is most irritating to Putin, I would say. Well, the, um, how, how does the, the, the desire for democracy and Zelensky's being representing that, how does that jibe with uh, the uh, nationalist movements? I mean, nationalist movements generally are not friendly toward Jews, right? They're, the Jew is an alien presence in the national body. Yes. But where does Zelensky fit in here? Is the, uh, How do the nationalists regard him? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, well, I'll say first, it's true that nationalist movements are generally not friendly to Jews unless they're Jewish nationalists. <laughs> <laughs> and coming from Israel, I can, I can talk about Jewish nationalists who are very friendly, to, only to Jews, in fact. So, I mean, it's not that Jews are exactly, you know, immune uh, from this predilection. But it's true. Look, I mean, I think there, there, there are two interesting things here. Uh, one is just to try to explain what I think uh, how Putin sees things and what he thinks he's accomplishing and then how it works in Ukraine. So what, what Putin has said very clearly and openly, uh, and Putin is like all these kind of dictators, he says what he means and he does what he says. There's no you know, beating around the bush. He wants to recreate Russia, Imperial Russia, and Ukraine is part of Imperial Russia, as I said, it, it came under Russian rule in the 18th century, and that's it. It is part of Russia, and the Black Sea should be a Russian sea. Uh, and you have to have Great Russia, White Russia, Belarus, and Little Russia, Ukraine. Uh, and then you need uh, all the periphery also to be demilitarized, all these other Slavs and other boats and so forth. So, the big issue for Putin is not Zelensky, this leadership or that leadership, it's a much bigger picture. He wants to recreate not the Soviet Union, but Imperial Russia. That is his historical goal. Right, right. Now, now within Ukraine, I, as I say, I mean, this is, and I found it, and I'm not the only one, uh, quite striking. Uh, there, there are uh, fringe uh, neo-Nazi elements in um, uh, in Ukraine. Um, the 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 nationalists. Is there any louder? Sorry. Uh, never mind. Um, never mind. <laughs> um, but Zelensky was was elected by a landslide. Uh, it's true that after he became president, he doesn't seem to be a terribly good manager. So he lost a lot of his popularity as a head of state. But at, at the time, in fact, there was, for a while, there was both a president and a prime minister who were Jews, and it was not part of the discourse. Now, whether there were people sitting in Lviv in all kind of nationalist pubs and um, talking against it, that's quite possible. It's certainly possible that many nationalists, and I know that, for a fact, do not want to accept that their own national heroes were engaged in the Holocaust. They deny it. That uh, clearly is the case. Yeah. But, but, but Zelensky himself represents a very different face of that society, and he seems to have carried it with him. And I think that is something that is important to remember, because all societies, including the United States, have racist, bigots, um, neo-Nazis, neo-Nazis, whatever you call them. Uh, and the question is not whether they exist, but whether they are on the fringe or they can move to the center, whether their government recognizes them and says, well, they're good people on both sides or it doesn't. That, to my mind, is the most important thing. And that has not happened in Ukraine. Uh, the direction has been in the opposite direction. Now, what will happen now is anybody's guess, because with all the destruction going on there now, I don't know what the body politic will be in the future. We, yeah, very good. Uh, we have a question about the economic evolution of the Ukraine uh, since the nationalist movement. Is, is, 
what about the economy in the Ukraine? Is that is that my my sense is that it has been building over recent years. Um, you know, economics sometimes plays a role in conflict. Is there where where are they economically now? I mean, they can't today. They've got to be hit very hard. Um, you, Russia's economy is not one of the biggest in the world at all, right? Well, this is, I mean, so in the case of Russia, um, you know, as, as Senator McCain said, right? I mean, uh, Russia is uh, is basically the the biggest um, gas station in the world. So, so Russia built its economy uh, on oil and gas. Now, it didn't have to do that. It, it, it does have huge mineral resources, but it didn't modernize its economy. Uh, and as anybody will tell you, 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 you don't own anything Russian at home, I, I, I suspect. I, I have one thing, I have a plate, a very nice wooden plate from Russia, uh, but that's about it, right? So, um, and, right. And, and, and Russia has the ability to do that. Now, Ukraine actually, has been developing its economy. Its problem was that it was, and it was until this war, remained a very corrupt. And there mm -hmm. were attempts, including by the current president, to um, try and go against its corruption, which is very endemic. It's, it's everywhere. But it has been developing. And, you know, traveling in Ukraine, I must say, I went there for the first time in 2003, and it was still recovering from the communist period. And you go now to Ukraine, well, you go now, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, when you went to Ukrainian cities to see Lviv, to see Kiev, they were beautiful, they, they were flourishing. Uh, and uh, Ukraine was uh, developing its industry. Uh, you should know that much of the, this was one of the ironies, that much of the war production or the war machines production uh, for Russia was done in Ukraine. Uh, right. Ukraine has a big industrial base. And, and so, yes, it had a good future ahead of it. And it was inching closer to the EU. Uh, and all of that... Uh, was seen by Russia as a threat. Um, now, historically, you know, Ukraine was seen as the breadbasket of Europe, uh, mm. the, the rich black land, black earth of uh, Ukraine. The Germans wanted it already in World War I, then they wanted it in World War II. Uh, Ukraine went through the, the, the horrifying uh, mass famine of 1931-32, the Holodomor, which was basically right. engineered from, from, the, from then also Moscow by, by Stalin and, and, and his henchmen. Mm -hmm. um, but it was about agriculture, but it was about collectivization. Right. And so it still has huge resources uh, and it could have developed into a very important part of the European economy. Uh, now it'll have to be rebuilt, of course. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, I have a question uh, about neo-Nazis. You mentioned neo-Nazis, the, uh, that there is a, there are neo-Nazis everywhere. Uh, is, do you know anything about the Azov Brigade? Do you know? Yes, yes. So the, the Azov Brigade, which is someplace now, I don't know exactly what it's doing, but it's, uh, uh, it was fighting in eastern Ukraine. It was recruited in West Ukraine, and it is made of, up of nationalists. Uh, they carry all kind of uh, uh, quasi or full Nazi symbols. Uh, more importantly, I didn't get into it in my talk. Um, there, there's something that many people, including myself, have found over the years uh, somewhat disturbing. Uh, and that is that uh, this organization of Ukrainian nationalists, uh, the, uh, the radical faction of which was uh, headed by, by Bandera, uh, had also an armed wing. And that armed wing was formed mm -hmm. in 1943. Now, it was destroyed by the Soviets. It was the, the UPA, the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. Uh, and it had a flag, and that flag uh, was red and black red for blood and black for the black earth. Uh, 
Now, the organization hasn't existed since the late 40s, but after the fall of communism in the 1990s, it was resurrected. And you will find it in all kinds of events. Again, more identified with West Ukraine. In East Ukraine, people were a bit, um, you know, Ukraine is a very diverse country also in terms of its geography and leanings. West Ukraine is more toward Europe, East Ukraine more toward Russia. But, it, but in West Ukraine, you would see a lot. You would see this flag. And I identified this flag with an organization that was involved in genocide and ethnic cleansing, genocide of Jews mm -hmm. and ethnic cleansing of Poles. And there's nothing very good to say about it. Uh, and many Ukrainians don't really want to think about it that way. They think of it as an organization that fought to liberate Ukraine from foreign rule. Right. Uh, so that's uh, one of those things that have Ukraine has not overcome. I th I'd say the, the Azov Brigade or Battalion or whatever it is, is the sort of more uh, extreme example that I don't think represents the whole. The story with the flag, that's a, that's a bit deeper than that, and it's more common. Yeah, well, the red and the black, the blood and the, and the earth brings to mind blue to Boden. So. It does bring to my Bluten Borden, and you know, Bluten Borden is the concept of all uh, ethno national um, nationalisms. Yes, yeah. uh, yes. And it exists, I, I, it exists, I experienced it also in, in my own uh, upbringing in Israel. <laughs> so not using the German words, uh, but you know, spilling blood for your homeland uh, was something that I was also internalizing as a young boy. Uh, and they come from the same root. They come from, from ethno-nationalism, ethno-territorial nationalism, and all these the Germans, the Poles, the Ukrainians, and the Zionists, took it from the same root. It's all about territory. The only difference was the Jews living in, like in Galicia, uh, who borrowed these symbols, uh, didn't think that that land was theirs. So they wanted to move to another land. But in that land, they developed a very similar concept. Uh, and so we, you know, there's room to criticize it. I'm happy to criticize it, uh, but, but there it is. Um, I, have, I have another question. Um, the question is, should we be concerned that this war will inflame global anti-Semitism and or anti-Zionism? And the questioner says, I, already I hear echoes of protocols of the elders of Zion in some analyses. Mm. Is this just to be expected? Is it harmless? Or could it lead to something dire? Um, you know, I, it's so hard to say um, it, because, you know, th there is a general rise in anti-Semitism that predates this war for sure. And you will find it in many places in Europe, in, in Central Europe, in Western Europe, in the United States. Uh, I, I was struck by how I, I was sort of trying to understand where the QAnon conspiracy theory comes from. And you will immediately, if you look at it, identify the protocols of the others of Zion and blood libel are the two main components of QAnon. Uh, it, that, that doesn't mean that people who follow QAnon have any idea of that, but, but there it is. Uh, now, whether that would be the case with war in Ukraine, I don't exactly see why, apart from two elements, one is what role is Israel playing there, and Israel is sort of mm -hmm. stuck uh, in a very uncomfortable position, uh, and that has to do both with its own Russian population, but more importantly, I would say, with the fact that Russia rules the sky over Syria, uh, and Israel has to sort of maneuver between being okay with the U.S. and being okay with Russia, and it's a small state. Um, so Israel is one case, and the other case, unfortunately, is the oligarchs. Um, uh -huh. And uh, about 70% of the main Russian oligarchs 
uh, are Jewish and uh, a number of them are, are from Ukraine. Um, but th that they create a pretty bad picture. <laughs> Uh, and as, as you know, um, th there is a relationship between them and Putin, uh, which is uh, basically each side supports the other. And the fact that a number of them are now seeking shelter in Israel makes things all the more uncomfortable. <laughs> to say the least. Yes. Um, well, let me, uh, there are a couple of questions uh, that, that, you know, lead into this, uh, given you mentioned Israel's precarious position between the, the, the U.S. and Russia in trying to deal with these two powers, uh, do, you, do you see that Israel might play any role as a kind of mediator or peacemaker? Uh, I'm sure Israel would like to see this come to an end. But, yeah, you know, I mean, Bennett tried, right? Uh, Bennett uh, went off to Moscow and to Berlin. Right. Uh, I, 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 I th I'm, I'm sure he has the best intentions, but um, I think he was doing it uh, to get Israel off the hook. Uh, now, as, as Zelensky says, you know, uh, Israel has... Uh, uh, many Russians in it. There, there are many people who speak Russian in Israel, and many of them come from Ukraine, uh, and it has actually decent relations both with Moscow and with Washington. Um, and, and so hypothetically, it could mediate. I don't, I, I, I think uh, the, uh, the solution will not come from Jerusalem. I don't think so. I think it'll, <laughs> Uh, if anything, it should come from China. Uh, but I don't think that Israel is uh, a, a big player in this at all. Super interesting. Well, uh, the situation poses its own problems for, for Israel, especially when you have Jews fleeing and you have Jews... Uh, who who can I who under the law of return yes find a haven in Israel I mean that's another another Israel uh, Israeli issue um, Dr Bartov I we're, we're about to the end of our hour this has been incredible I've had uh, several comments in, uh, in the chat on how profoundly insightful. Uh, your analysis is. Uh, thank you so much. This has been wonderful and brilliant. Um, I want to remind our listeners that uh, next week, next Sunday at one o'clock central time, we will host uh, Melanie Phillips for her insights into problems facing Jews, both at home and in, in, uh, in the diaspora. Um, Rabbi Khan, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to offer? Obvious cause to Dr. Bartow for such an insightful and such an informative uh, talk uh, certainly we needed so, so timely, especially in view of what's happening today. Uh, we certainly have, uh, we certainly should help uh, uh, the Ukraine in any, any way we can, the Jewish people in Ukraine. And there are many ways we can do this um, and uh, all we have to do is go to uh, the Federation or other organizations that will, uh, that will, uh, uh, that will uh, see to it that our charity uh, gets to the right place. Um, again, uh, Dr. Bartov, so wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And of course, we owe a debt of gratitude uh, to Dr. David Pedersen, as always, for making this possible for making this possible. God bless you, David. God bless you, David. God bless you. We all love you, and uh, we appreciate you to no end. God bless all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And remember, remember next week's lecture. Yeah, watch your emails. Be safe. Be blessed. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.